So before I start, I want to take this opportunity to thank Krell um, for all the support throughout my PhD. It's really made my research possible and enjoyable as well, and it, it's always fun to be at this program review. Um, okay, right, so the title of my talk is Quantum Information and Gravity. It's really going to be more or less an overview of some of the research I've been doing, especially over the past two and a half years. Um, the field is pretty large, actually, so, well, and it's been growing. Um, so instead of talking about everything, I'll focus on one particular aspect of it, which is to use quantum information to understand how locality emerges in gravity. So um, before I start, I'm just going to, uh, okay. Um, before, I, before I talk about locality and gravity, maybe let me explain what I mean by locality just in general. So um, for theories without gravity, um, and I'm talking about like fundamental interactions here, so the way we describe these theories is using quantum field theory. Um, and what locality means in quantum field theory is really that um, it respects causality from special relativity. So from special relativity, we know that points, um, you know, the speed of light is finite, so points that cannot that are essentially outside the range of, of communicating with, with the speed of light, they should not affect each other. So that, that's what we mean by causality, essentially. And um, the term that we use for that is, is essentially two points are space-like if um, they cannot be reached by any um, light ray or, or an, an observer that is massive as well. Um, and in quantum field theory, we, we work on a fixed space-time manifold, so it's, it's very easy to define the regions in which light can reach from some point. Um, and of course we want to translate between this language from special, of special relativity, which, is, um, which is determines when two points are space-like separated, to something in a, in a more quantum language. And the way that we, we translate between, between causality and special relativity in quantum field theory is through something that we call micro-causality. And the, this isn't too important, but the mathematical description of that is that two operators commute if they are space-like separated. So the, the most intuitive way to understand this is with this picture, O of X and O of Y. Uh, so I, have, I drew the light cone. A massive observer can, 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 from the point X, can go anywhere to the future here. Or it could have come from the past anywhere in this white region here. And O of Y is outside this region. So the operators that are local to these points should commute, and what, that, what this zero commutator means is that they can't affect each other. Okay, so now, um, now let's go to gravity. Once we introduce gravity from, special relativ from general relativity, we know that space-time becomes dynamical. So space-time itself is changing. And I've blurred this picture because already you can, you can imagine that it becomes a little bit harder to, to, to define what we mean by um, by causality in, in, in the space-time that is dynamical in of itself. Um, so there's some additional difficulties that actually come up that are, that are not just, um, that are a consequence of space-time being dynamical but not directly obvious, is that even just defining O of X like corresponding to an operator at point X and O of Y cor which corresponds to an operator at point Y is actually not that easy. So we, we, we say that these operators are not gauge invariant. Um, it, it essentially, what it means is that they're meaningless by themselves. Um, I'll give an example to try, um, to try to explain that a little bit better. So if you imagine having an empty room, it's easy to put coordinates. You can just put Cartesian coordinates from the bottom right corner of that room, and you can define any point from there. Now, if I just put one particle in there, say an electron, um, you would imagine that you can just, just do, describe points in the same way. Now, Effectively, we can do this because the electron isn't very massive, but fundamentally, the electron does have a mass, and it will affect the space-time inside the room. So we say that the electron back-reacts in that space-time. That means that the, the way you choose coordinates is no longer unique. So just specifying where the electron is by a point, that's not enough. We, you need to essentially put some more information on that operator. Uh, a, a, more, um, a more concrete example, even, and I chose an electron for that reason, is that the electron is charged, and we know that a charged particle will create an electric field. So, you know, it's inconsistent to just describe a theory where the electron is there and there's no electric field. It's the same way in gravity. And 
the, the punchline of this is that gravity is inherently non-local. And we knew that gravity is non-local at very low length, small length scales, but it's, it seems like it's even beyond that. So here's a couple of pictures that, that, describe, that describe how one might, might do this procedure of, of labeling points. Oh, and before I talk about that, I'll mention one more, more thing, is that in quantum mechanics, we can consider superpositions of different states, and, and that's all good, but if we're doing quantum gravity, then we should be able to consider superpositions of different spacetimes. And that's another difficulty in defining locality. What do you mean by a light cone in a, in a state which is a superposition of different spacetimes? So one invariant way, sort of, or one way to define these operators that is good across a variety of spacetimes is to make use of structures that are there in all of these spacetimes, or at least for a class of them. For example, say we have a spacetime that has a boundary. So for simplicity, I'm just going to imagine the spacetime being the disk and the boundary being the circle. Um, if the boundary is there across all of these spacetimes, I can just, I can un essentially consistently pick coordinates on that boundary that are the same on all of these spacetimes. So it's fine to just pick a point on the boundary and label it by those coordinates. Then I can say, shoot a geodesic uh, perpendicular to the boundary and go a proper length that way. And I, the way that I just described this makes sense across any spacetime, even if I place a black hole in there. It will inevitably change the geodesic and the point that I, that I reach from that, um, from that procedure looks slightly different, but that way of labeling it is consistent across all of these spacetimes. So, um, but the way that I described that point was inherently non-local. I had to make reference to something really far away from that point to describe it. So all of these examples are so far just to illustrate the nature of the problem, and it's not immediately obvious. So there is um, another way in which it's actually much more obvious that gravity should be, or ha should have some form of non-locality. And that is actually the fact that gravity, we say, is holographic. So what holography means is that we, so we say a theory is holographic, essentially, if we have a theory in d plus one dimensions, a gravitational theory in d plus one dimensions, that should really be described by a probably non-gravitational theory in d dimensions, so it would be in one lower dimension than that. So if, if we imagine the space-time being this, this triangle, we, we would say, okay, we have a manifold here, and that manifold has stars and particles and all of the usual things in cosmology. Um, but to really describe that theory, we, we, choose, we would have to have a surface inside that space-time that's one dimension lower. So you can imagine that, you can see that that's already going to be very non-local because how would you map all the information of the stars? So you, you'd imagine in here you might have some galaxies and stars and you know, we imagine these galaxies and stars really living at that point. But what holography says is that that information should really be contained in just one lower dimension. So, a so if you have three-dimensional space inside of this room, we'd imagine all the information being contained on the walls of that room. So inevitably, this mapping is non-local. And this seems a little bit ad hoc, but actually ever since the early days of black uh, studying black holes from Stephen Hawking, we, we knew that its entropy scaled like the area of the black hole and not the volume. And we know from, from just from statistical mechanics that entropy is a measure of, degree, of number of degrees of freedom. So there's some already hint here that the number of degrees of freedom in black holes, which is an inherently gravitational object, is scaling like its area and not its volume. Okay, so this is, uh, just to paint a picture, but well, we have a concrete example of this, and it's called the anti de Sitter conformal field theory correspondence. So thankfully we have, it, I'm not gonna go too, too in depth about this, but we have an example of this, and it's, it, there's some derivation from string theory, but it's more or less mathematically precise, and it came out in, at the end of 97, and we've had 20 years of research. It's actually the most highly cited paper in my field. This is slightly outdated, but it had 13,000 citations, which at least in my field is unheard of in 20 years. Um, so we've been studying this a lot and trying to understand quantum gravity from that point of view. Um, so we've had 20 years of research, and I would like to give it, I would like to come here and give a concrete answer. This is how locality emerges. This is what space-time really is. But after 20 years, we still don't have that. As a matter of fact, it turns out that we can't even answer, or we can't agree on if there is even an interior of a black hole or not. This is not the topic of my talk, but I'm happy to talk about that as well. Um, but one way, one, what we say is that we don't have a complete dictionary between the two theories. So that is, we don't know how to map 
objects in the ADS spacetime to the boundary of that theory, which is where, so we understand the conformal field theory very well because it's not gravitational. We don't understand this very well, but we don't even know how to do this mapping. Um, so that's not to say we don't know anything. Um, I'll skip the equations. Um, we, do, we do know a few things. If the operators are really close to the boundary, we, we actually know how to map from one side to the other. But that's not super interesting because really close to the boundary, nothing interesting happens gravitationally. So how do we bring that operator further away? So say I want to describe an operator inside here. Well, we actually figured out how to do that as well. There's a very non-local mapping. I mean, with the equation, we, we, we can imagine it's, it's an integral. It doesn't really matter, but it, what, it, what it essentially says is that one local operator at some point here gets, you, you require the whole region of the boundary that's spaced like to that point. So it would be the whole pink region is needed to describe that one point. Very non-local, of course, as well. Um, so it turns out that we can do even a little bit better than that. Um, it, I, I'll, I'll, this, this procedure is called HKLL. I might refer it to, by its name a few times. But it turns out that you don't need the whole boundary. We can, take some, we can take some hints from causality and actually, instead of taking the whole boundary, just restrict it to a subregion in that boundary and then ask the question, uh, what is the region inside of the bulk that can be reached from light rays inside that boundary? So, You'll, you'll carve out a wedge, and we call that the causal wedge, because I guess we're not super creative with names. Um, <laughs> so it turns out that if you want to do the same procedure and rewrite a local operator inside that wedge as in terms of boundary quantities, you can do so without requiring operators delocalized throughout the whole boundary, but only delocalized throughout, throughout this boundary pink region that I've drawn. So already there's a hint that we, um, we are doing something slightly redundant in the, last, in the last slide. It turns out that this is not entirely the end of the story, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so the, the two main takeaways here is that we, we thought that using causality would help us a little bit, which we like very much in, in gravity. Um, and and the, other point, uh, the other point is that this is much more efficient in some way. You're, you're not using your whole boundary to describe an operator. Okay, so now I, I, I'm gonna go through this in a little bit more detail. The formula looks roughly like this. It's an integral with some smearing function um, that one can, one can solve, and the O's are objects in the boundary. But I didn't mention this explicitly yet, but in all of these procedures, doing this reconstruction, uh, essentially, which is writing bulk operators in terms of boundary quantities, required knowing what the bulk metric is in the first place. So that means that if I didn't know what that bulk space time was before doing this procedure, I wouldn't have been able to get, to get this, this answer that I'm looking for. That's not really satisfactory from my point of view because the duality says that if you know everything on one side, you should be able to reconstruct everything on the other side. But this mapping required previous knowledge of essentially the bulk in the first place. And what we really want is starting from only the, the boundary theory, we want to be able to reconstruct what the space-time looks like in the bulk in the first place, and then do this procedure. And up till, up till well, up till then, and I, I've worked on this, so I've made some progress on it, um, we didn't know how to do this. Um, so, so, so the point is that we really want to start from, from the point where we don't really know the metric or the geometry at all in the first place. Um, so I'm going to take a, a slight break from that and introduce some new concepts that were going to be required to, to at least partially resolve this paradox. And that's the concept of entanglement. And that's, at least so far, even though my title was quantum information, this is probably the first, the first part where quantum information is playing a role. Entanglement is pretty important in quantum information. Um, so there's a, measure, there's a measure of entanglement called um, entanglement entropy, um, which is, at least for pure states, it's essentially just a von Neumann entropy of, of the density matrix of that state. So the formulas don't really matter, but imagine we have now some measure, some measure that, that more or less captures how much entanglement you have in a certain subregion of your, of your quantum state. So you know, all of this is quantum mechanical, so the, we still have a boundary here. I can imagine just looking at the state restricted to half of that boundary, that would be the green region here. And then I can ask the question, how much 
is this region entangled with the other for a particular quantum state? And that's a calculation one can do. Um, and it turns out that that calculation is hard, but there is a very geometric interpretation of this, and that's by looking at these extremal surfaces. So this was done in ADS-CFT. I thought that this was much more fundamental, so one of my, uh, one of my research projects was actually to extend this beyond a general to a general class of spacetimes, and we were able to prove that such an extension satisfies a bunch of um, entanglement inequalities. Um, since this isn't really the focus, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so now let's go back to reconstruction. So it, it seems already, so it seems already that entanglement and geometry are playing, are, are pretty related in this point because I said that entanglement was measured by geometry, by a geometric quantity in the first place, which was, was the, were these areas through, through the surface that I had in that picture. So now, now let's look at this reconstruction a little bit more carefully again. Say I want, so I, here I, I drew, um, the, the, what, what I mentioned were the causal wedges. Um, it, it can be a little bit more general than that, but let's, let's stick to causal wedges for now. Um, and I, have, I divided the boundary into three regions, and the point that I want to reconstruct is in neither of the three regions. So the procedure I mentioned shouldn't work for any of them. But if it isn't, it isn't the union of any two regions. So essentially, if I take A union B, it, it includes this whole area as well. So this point can be reconstructed in A union B, B union C or C union A. Essentially, there's three different reconstructions that I can use for this point, um, which actually leads to a paradox because we know from the first slide that in quantum field theory, if operators are space-like, they commute. So if I rewrite phi, if I reconstruct phi in AB, I'll call phi AB, it will not affect anything in C. And if I rewrite in AC, it will not affect anything in B, and so on. So, but the only operator that doesn't affect anything anywhere else is a trivial one, is the identity. And does that, obviously, you know, if this is really a particle or something in the ADS spacetime, it's not the identity. It's, it's something that is actually real. So there seems to be a puzzle here. Um, it turns out that here's the second point that I'll mention from quantum information theory. Uh, you, can, you can resolve this, par this paradox by thinking about quantum error correction. Um, so so what quantum, in quantum error correction, we essentially encode a lower dimensional subspace in a higher dimensional, we, we take a special subspace of a higher dimensional space, and this subspace has some properties that if you lose some of the information, you can still recover it from the rest. So um, here I have an example, it, it's a three qubit subspace, of, so it's a three dimensional subspace of a 27 dimensional space because each, each little digit here is three dimensional. Um, so, um, uh, just for the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip a, a lot of the, the derivation, but essentially, there's a mapping from this problem to, to the quantum error correction scheme that I have here. And this mapping is more than just a picture. It turns out that you can prove that if you have an operator located inside what's called the entanglement wedge, which is slightly bigger than that causal wedge I defined, that's why I said it was wrong, it's actually a larger region, it, it can certainly be reconstructed there. Okay, so now to, back to, to the emergence of space-time itself. Um, we know that the operator can be reconstructed, and we have that reconstruction procedure that I defined initially. So can we do this without the knowledge of what the bulk space-time is in the first place? Well, from the quantum error correction scheme, we saw that information was redundantly encoded in the boundary. And we have that theorem that says that if your point is in this, this so-called entanglement wedge, it will be, we will be able to reconstruct it. So studying this a little bit more carefully, we can exploit this redundancy to define what a local operator is from the boundary without knowing any knowledge of the bulk. And this is something I did, and I proved that this can be done at least for a large region of many spacetimes. So, in addition to that, what do we gain? It turns out that using this, the fact that in the boundary causality is a very usual thing because there's no gravity, it's just quantum field theory, we can actually recover the geometry inside the bulk, in the, or at least almost recover it. We don't have the conformal factor. I think that that can be achieved and that's something I'm still working on, but essentially using the, the message that I want to, to get across here is that using quantum error correction, or these techniques from quantum information theory, we can actually learn a lot about gravity, 
and we can, we can use, exploit that to answer a lot of questions that we otherwise couldn't. In particular, what does the geometry look like inside here in the first place? So here, it's just a picture. This is, this is actually a, a black hole in that particular class of space times. Um, um, and it, this is the region that one can reconstruct. Um, it turns out that near the singularity it doesn't work, which is interesting in its own right. Um, but I'll, I'll just conclude quickly here, and um, a few, so a few points that we know, gravity is holographic, and despite non-localities in gravity, we know that approximate locality more or less works. We want to understand what the fundamental mechanisms here are, and we don't have a complete answer yet, and there's been a lot of research that, that's been done over this whole, over like the past 20 years. Um, so, and we also want to understand this mapping, and it turns out that recently, quantum, quantum information theory more generally, but specifically quantum error correction and its redundancy of the information in, in between the bulk and the boundary can be exploited and it's very useful. Um, there's of course a lot more, a lot more to, to study here and you know, that's, I'll, but I'll leave it here for now.